not a lot. I did find various articles where the title had been written in such a way as to imply that an all-new life form had been discovered, as though a second abiogenesis event had occurred. It wasn't new life, but the discovery was analogous to finding a new species with a unique ability not seen in other organisms. Having read the NASA report, which is freely available, I rejected the notion the media had placed about the organism being all new. The NASA team had already classified this organism in detail. They called it Gamma Proteobacteria GFAT1 Extremophile. The last term, Extremophile, tells us this organism is able to survive extreme conditions, in this case, an arsenic rich environment. I was unsure as to why the organism was named GFAG1, so I focused on the more familiar Gamma Proteobacteria term. Biologists arrange different forms of life according to their similarities or relatedness. So you're left with a tree-like structure called a tree of life, where life branches off and diversifies, yet all linked together by a common ancestor. Gamma proteobacteria is one of many different classes of bacteria in the proteobacteria phylum. Common bacteria such as E. coli, Salmonella and Vibrio are all in this class. So we find that this life isn't completely new at all. It wasn't formed due to another abiogenesis event either, but rather this organism evolved from a predecessor which was unable to tolerate arsenic to now the more advanced organism which is able to not just tolerate arsenic but also integrate it into its cellular components. This might not seem like a big deal to some, but for those of us who like to speculate about life beyond our planet, it's a very nice find. It may lend some support to the idea that life on other planets may be possible, even if they are not abundant with carbon. Um, for example, silicon abundant planets may give rise to silicon-based life instead of carbon-based life, and this may be possible due to the similar chemistry these elements have. To understand why, we need to look at the periodic table, where you will find that the elements are arranged in groups. The reason they are arranged in such groups is due to their similar properties. Have a look at the first group, the alkali metals. A common school demonstration is to show how alkali metals react with water. They all react with water, but some react more violently than others. This is due to the fact that as you go down the group, you get an extra shell. The electrons in the outer shell are more likely to be lost as their distance from the nucleus has increased. This means the nucleus has a weaker hold on the outer electrons, and the outer electrons being lost more easily allows for a more vigorous reaction. Whether you've left school or you're still at school, you can appreciate the sheer fun and mayhem that chemistry can be. There's so much to it. Bunsen burners, mixing chemicals. Very nice. Now, you may have been allowed to mix very small amounts of lithium with water. You may, if with a responsible adult, have mixed H2O with sodium. And you may, under very strict scientific control, have witnessed potassium mixed with water. But the odds are, if you have, it will only ever have been on one of those rubbish science videos. There you go, mate, present. Oh, These next two are the dog's nuts of the periodic table. They are, if you like, the king and queen of alkali metals. Mix these babies with water, stand well back, and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr. Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right, up. I'm off. Have that. OK. Good luck. <sighs> OK, Tickle. Drop the rubidium in the water. Stand by 
Look, everybody, this one's going to be bad. Our two grams of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. Is more like it. Only on Brainiac do you get that kind of science. But I believe we can go one better. There is one more alkali metal we can legally use. Yes, Richard, cesium, the emperor of alkali metals, particularly nasty, could go off at any time. And that's it? Oh, yes. Brilliant. I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? Imagine a depth charge in a bathtub. Fair enough, mate. I'll leave you to it. Good luck. Thank you. OK, John, go for it. Warning, 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 extreme danger, clear the area. As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. <laughs> Magnificent. And I think that concludes today's experiment. There is, I should say, one more, even more reactive metal, francium. But for some reason, they wouldn't let us have any of that. Still, there you go. Today's lesson, never mixed alkali metals with water. Phosphorus and arsenic are in the same group. Arsenic has an extra shell of electrons and a different atomic number. But both still share the same number of electrons in the outer shell. They both also share the same state at room temperature, which is solid, so we expect arsenic to have a similar chemistry to phosphorus. The similarities in the chemistry is demonstrable, as compounds with either arsenic or phosphorus will give similar arrangements. Here's a molecule of DNA. If you look closer, you'll see that the DNA backbone is composed of two main parts, a pentose sugar and a phosphate group. GFAG1 is able to substitute phosphate with arsenic. Most organisms are unable to do this without suffering ill effects. Arsenic, for example, inhibits ATP production in cells, which is an important process for energy generation. The interesting thing is that GFAG1 is able to thrive in an arsenic-rich environment without suffering the ill effects like the rest of us. We use biotechnology to make organisms do the work for us. Such examples in development are bio-mining and phyto-mining. Bio-mining or bio-leaching involve the use of microorganisms to extract metals from their ores. It may be possible to apply this principle to extract arsenic from the environment. You could also, for example, use genetically modified bacteria to act as biosensors. So it may be possible to genetically modify GFAG1 to fluoresce when it detects arsenic, but this technique has only been tested with TNT, so we do have bacteria which could potentially fluoresce when they detect explosives involving TNT. Phyto mining involves the use of plants to extract chemicals and metals by the roots. You can then incinerate the plant to extract the metal. An example of this technique is cesium and strontium extraction in Chernobyl by the use of a certain form of a sunflower. However, we do already have an example where arsenic can be extracted from water supplies by the use of water hyacinth and duskweed. Richard Charnock was taking a group from the All Hallows Catholic High School on a trip to Italy when he heard about the comments from the Vatican astronomer. I think it's preposterous that they're saying that. You know, there is uh, one uh, humans that God created. You know, we come back to the Bible. He didn't create Adam, Eve, and E.T., did he? It's Adam and Eve. What if the aliens come bearing the crosses and showing the Bible? What if will y'all change and say, "Oh huh. my God, I that was would wrong"? Be pretty, that would be pretty impressive evidence.